again to spirit, truth, and life. I just love some of these old hymns. No matter what you say, they're not a mark of my age, they're a mark of quality. The hymns that last and last through time have a message that's critical for so many people to enjoy, just to know Jesus, to trust and obey. It's like being plugged into Him. His power flows through us, and it's easy to do what He tells us to do, because He gives the power to do it. Now, I still in spite of being a person who normally doesn't preach with glasses on, I'm, I've had some people have a comment. He says, you know, I see these guys preaching on television, and they never take their Bible and read the text. Well, today I'm going to be preaching directly out of a text. And so, pardon, pardon me, uh, magnifiers for some of that part. I see fine otherwise. And many times I can read, I get just the right distance, but it's a little easier if it's larger. So in Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he has a lot of wonderful blessings for us. Beginning in chapter 3, verse 8, he says, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the unfathomable riches of Christ. The gospel is what? He says it's the unfathomable fathomable riches of Christ. Well, I grew up in the ocean. I, I grew up in the ocean. What is a fathom? It is six feet. When you measure the depth of water beside a ship, they used to measure it with a, a weighted rope and they had knots every six feet on it so they could tell how deep the water was. In fact, if you read in the book of Acts, you hear about that happening. They were measuring how many fathoms it was, and suddenly they're close to the bottom, hitting the bottom. And this is unfathomable. You've got rope that's not long enough. That's what it means. You can't measure it. It's too much. And Paul says it was a privilege that was given to him by the grace of given to him to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. It's bigger... And the title of my sermon, I've forgotten. Somebody's asking, but it's on the screen. They'll get it for you. <laughs> we don't need to worry about, oh, are you ready, I think is the title. But we're talking here about what is the purpose of all this, the gospel, what's happening. And he's preaching something that's beyond our measurement. So he said it's unfathomable. And then he says in verse 9, and he says it's to bring to light... What is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things? So that the wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. 
Now Paul makes a comment in Romans, and I'm not going to look it up right now, but he says, had the rulers, had Satan and his allies understood God's plan of salvation for Christ to die and be raised again, he would have never crucified him. So there are things in Scripture that are stated, but eyes are blinded from seeing them, from understanding them, until the right time. Jesus told his disciples, they're going to prison me, they're going to beat me, they'll crucify me and bury me, and the third day I'll be raised again. And Luke says their minds were blinded. They, they just couldn't understand it. Even the disciples didn't understand it. God kept them from understanding it, although it was stated, because Satan, the great unbeliever, wouldn't believe it anyway either. So they didn't understand the crucifixion until afterwards, and Satan didn't understand until it was too late. He'd already been defeated by Jesus. And that's the kind of thing we're looking at here when we see this. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This isn't about to prove it to the people in the world. This isn't about to prove it to Caesar. This wasn't about to prove it to the President of the United States. No. It was to prove it to the devil and his angels that God is really right. That's what the good news is, that God really is right. He really loves. He loves. He cares about me and you. He says, Dick, you are so valuable, so important to me, that I did this expensive errand so you could live with me, so you can have the image of God restored in you that was lost when sin entered this world in Adam. So we could do that. Now I want to take you over to Luke 11. Or 19, excuse me. Luke 19. Jesus has a wonderful parable here. And Luke tells us why he gave the parable. Luke 19, 11. This is right after Zacchaeus. And Bartimaeus seeing, being healed. He says in verse 11, while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because, you ready for why he told the parable? Because he was near Jerusalem. Now you think Jericho's way over there, Jerusalem's over here, but it's really only about 20 miles. It's a long walk, but it's not that terribly far. We sometimes think of everything in the scale of America or Russia or something like that, some great distances. Uh, Israel is a very tiny place, very small, about maybe the size of Connecticut, but it's not very big. They were near Jerusalem and on their way, and he supposed they, who's they? The people that were listening to these, they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. After all, John the Baptist preached the kingdom of God is coming. Repent, because it's coming. Jesus said, the kingdom has come upon you. They were preaching the kingdom, teaching people to repent and, and trust God. And so people all over were hearing this. They're getting excited. Wow, there's the kingdom's coming, the kingdom's coming. They'd heard from Isaiah and Jeremiah and other things that there's a big thing coming. But they didn't know the nature of the kingdom. They didn't understand it. So he could, they thought this is going to happen and their great hopes were up. Whoopee, when the king arrives, he'll drive out the Romans miraculously or powerfully and suddenly, wow, we'll be in the kingdom. Now, people have all kinds of ideas about the kingdom of God and what it's going to do. And even today, there are many people with many different ideas about what's going to happen in these last days. Some people are trying to tell you that they know exactly what's going to happen. Well, I can tell you exactly only one thing. Jesus is coming. And when he comes, sin will be no more allowed. But here until then, there are plenty of options of what, how it's going to happen. And I'm not hung up over how it's going to happen, even though I grew up in a group that spent a lot of time talking about it. 
always speculating, always having a new idea, something different. And, and they had fragments of truth. That's why they kept clinging to it, saying, we got this fragment and this fragment. And this. I think it all goes together this way. That's called speculation or hypothesizing if you're a scientist. They had their hypotheses. And he's telling us because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves, gave them ten minus, and said to them, do business with this till I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that those slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that they might know what business they had done. Did I skip something here? Yes, he called ten slaves and gave them ten minus and said to them, do business with this till I come back. Each one got one. They got it. And so he checked on them when he got back. And the first one appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said, Well done, you good slave. You've been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be authority over ten cities. And the second one came saying, Your mina, Master, has made five minas. And he said, Also, you are to be over five cities. And a third one came and saying, Master, here's your mina. I kept it away in a handkerchief because I was afraid of you. Because you're an exacting man. You do everything a certain way. You take up what you don't lay down. You reap what you don't sow. And he said, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. You knew. Did you know that I'm an exacting man? Taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I didn't sow? Well then, why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. You knew what you needed to do. Now, I want to back up on this story because we've got more coming. In this story, look at that. The nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Jesus came here. He lived a perfect life. He died. He was raised from the dead. He ascended to heaven. And when he returns, it's to establish the final position of his kingdom for himself. That where I am there you may be also, he says. He's coming here to receive us to himself. Now that's an important principle, see. He's talking about his own future in a parable. And what's going on? It says, but his citizens hated him, saying, we don't want this man to reign over us. You know the story of how the leadership of the church there in Jerusalem they were so jealous of Jesus, they murdered him. They had him murdered by the Romans because they just couldn't stand to have him there. They were the delegation that Jesus is talking about, the ones who hated him. He mentions it. And he talks about those who trust, do what he does and trust what he says and those who don't. And it's just a, it's an amazing thing that we look at in this story because the story continues. He says, by your own words, I'll judge you, you worthless slave. And then in verse 24, he turned to the bystanders and he said, take the miner away from him, give it to the one who had ten. And they all stood by and said, well, master, he already has ten. And he says, I tell you, everyone who has more has, more shall be given. But for the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Now what is it they have and don't have? If I look at this story, the successful slaves had an increase. They had fruit from their efforts. They turned what was handed to them and made it bigger. It grew. And the bad ones didn't have any profit for him. And so he says, whoever does not have, what he has shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Kill them. 
That's a description of the destruction of the wicked at the end of time. It's not a chronology, it's a description. It's a parable that says, here's what we should see. And they were expecting the kingdom to appear, but he doesn't stop with this parable. He does not stop with the parable in verse 28. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead up toward Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the mountain that's called Olivet, he sent two disciples ahead of him. Now we're only a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. Maybe an hour's walk at the most. And he sent them two disciples and said, Go ahead of you, and there as you enter you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. And untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks, Why are you untying it? You'll say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying a colt, the owner said, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. Now how much instruction did these men have? Not very much. He didn't tell them what he was going to do with it. He didn't tell them anything about this. But we've got this excitement in the community and the crowd that follows that maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's going to establish the new kingdom. And they bring the colt. And in verse 35, they brought it to Jesus and threw their coats on the colt and Jesus sat on it. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. The people were. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. And they were shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus said, I tell you, if these be silent, the stones will cry out. If they're silent, the stones will cry out. And when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. Sad picture. He was saying, if you'd known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes, the things that make for peace. Now let's stop here for a moment. Because there are many, many people today who care a lot about Jerusalem, the city, because they believe certain viewpoints on the future. And while I may not agree with everything they believe about it, they say, you know, Isaiah said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that's correct. Yeah, Isaiah did say that. And Isaiah died a long, hundreds of years before this time. And here Jesus is saying, if you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but they've been hidden from your eyes. If a person doesn't know what it takes to make peace, they can't make peace. Today we live in a world racked by arguments and terror and difficulty and trials. But peace is what God wants in our hearts. Because if we have His peace in our hearts, we will not be offended at other people. We will not make war with them. We won't be condemning them. We'll be living in the way Christ wants us to live. Had you known this day even the things that make for peace, but now they've been hidden for your, from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. They did not recognize what it meant to have the Messiah visiting them, the Christ. I struggle with this. How do I say this without somebody getting terribly offended? I don't know. But I'm going to say it anyway because it's God's word. Jesus said there will not be one stone left on another. If you go to Jerusalem today, there are some ancient ruins. Ancient ruins that date back to the time of Jesus. 
they go by a popular name that didn't appear in history until about 800 AD. And they began to call it the Temple Mount, as if it were the foundations of Solomon's Temple. None of the early records agree with that. The description in the Old Testament of where the Temple Mount was, was about 600 feet south of that structure. You see what people today call the Wailing Wall and Jews come there and prayers in there and have worship. But they're, they're following a tradition of men, not the Word of God. Because Jesus said, not one stone will be left on another. There are 10,000 original stones there in that particular structure. And none of them come from the city of Jerusalem. None of them come from the temple. They are the foundation of an old Roman fortress called the Antonia, which was built just outside the city. Outside the city wall, up the hill from the temple. About 600 feet up the hill. When they burned and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, and afterwards, all the contemporary reports say there was nothing recognizable there from Israel, from Jerusalem, the city. Everything had been hauled away or destroyed. It was like a plowed field. There was nothing left. Now, the idea that the, what they call the Temple Mount is the place of Solomon's temple is a wonderful deception of the devil to create stir up disputes. Because even today the Jewish leaders do not understand, they do not understand that that is not a temple of God. There are two Islamic churches on it, but it never was the temple of God. It never was anything built by Jerusalem or Zerub by Solomon or under Zerubbabel or rebuilt under Herod. All of that was 600 feet away in an area that's a residential area now on the edge of Jerusalem. But that whole city was totally destroyed. All the structural materials, the stones and whatnot, eventually were taken away from there and moved away to another site of another town near Jer what it was Jerusalem. And so what we have there is a very bad lie. The devil wanted this kind of an idea because then people wouldn't pay attention to Jesus. They'd pay attention to Jerusalem. They'd say, oh my, we have to have our capital in Jerusalem. Notice what Jesus said here. Had you known the things that make for righteousness and peace. Let me get it right here. Verse 42. If you had known in this day even you the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you, hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children with you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling. And he said, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among people were trying to destroy him. And they could not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. We have this experience of tradition being so strong power structures becoming so mighty that they go against God. There was nothing wrong with the Jews to start with. They were believers. They were God's children. But they were perverted. Their structure had died. And Jesus said, this is not about who's the high priest. This is not about how much money you put in the offering basket. This is about whether you know me, God says. John 1.12 Jesus said, as many as, or John says, as many as received Jesus, to them he became authority to be the sons of God. You see, it's about rising from the dead. No longer being a carnal human, but being a son of God, full of the Holy Spirit and power. 
And Paul said in Galatians, you know, did you do all these miracles and wondrous things by keeping the law or because of the Spirit? Because you believed. The real rule here is that we believe in Jesus and we look for him to return. We look forward to being raised up from this earth forever to be with the Lord. And that's a blessing. There's no, nothing evil, nothing weak or wrong in it. But the joy of the Lord is what builds us up in His power to bless others, to guide them and direct them so that we will be faithful servants. So He'll say, welcome you faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what God wants. That's what is the real key, that we can live now in the power of God and other people can be drawn to Jesus so they can live in Him too. This is your blessing. This is your power to live. And I know that there is no greater blessing than the joy of living in the power of Jesus. <laughs>